Fantastic. Um, let's first of all um, say a big um, hello to everybody who has joined us. And we had an, uh, really a large number of um, registrations. And um, that's, of course, fantastic on, in this period of time that everybody is um, starting their offices again. And um, I really have to give the honor and the special privilege to our uh, co-speaker today, uh, Dr. Giovanni Zucchelli. Giovanni, how are you? I can see you. You have, um, you look good. You look healthy, and you have a very special T-shirt. It's not my last name, but it's almost. No. <laughs> no. So, Similar. how are you? I'm very, very fine safe and fine. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the very, very kind invitation. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Yeah. Explain us like your um, uh, Mihailovich uh, last name. He must be um, um, obviously yeah, a soccer is, player or a tennis player. He was, but I think he, was, he, he, was, he was a soccer player. Now soccer, he's okay. uh, the coach of my football team. And he's really great. Uh, he's really great guy. He was a heel, but despite this, he was able to 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 train my football team and to make my football team successful. And I really love him. That's why I dedicated all my uh, webinars during the lockdown to him and to my football team. Good. And, and is he a patient of yours as well or a friend? No, 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 no. Yeah, I just met him twice, but uh, he's not a friend of mine. But he's, okay. like, you know, he, he is a great example for everybody that something can change in our life in one second. And despite this, he reacted so well. And that's why I like him so much. Okay, well, knowing my colleague uh, Serbians and my my colleague uh, creations i'm sure he has some uh, uh, periodontal recessions or like periodontal conditions <laughs> uh, he will he will be very happy to have your services in the future <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i will be happy to know him independently yeah. okay giovanni so um um you and i we have been um, you know supporting each other and following each other for many years um we're both uh, periodontists. We're both interested in tissues. Of course, um, your focus has been very much on um, periodontal soft tissues. And uh, my focus was um, a little bit more on the bone uh, tissues, but like we've always uh, seen each other. And uh, I think like I've always looked at uh, with big admiration and big respect at your work. So um, uh, tell us a little bit from when, kind of just because this is like, an, uh, like a very personal interview that we're having with you. So it's also always very nice to get to know the long term of somebody's career and uh, you know, what you developed uh, and how you started. So I know, of course, that you have had uh, a long journey with periodontal soft tissues, with regeneration, the Periodontal Italian Society has been so yeah. powerful in the last 30 years. Um, how did you kind of develop the techniques that you have developed? And what are, is different today in these techniques uh, that we have also new biomaterials and um, new protocols? What's different today than maybe 30 years ago when you started? Oh, yes. I, uh, just to explain in two words, I have been a periodontist starting from the beginning. I did my university in Bologna. I, then I postgraduate in uh, Bologna in the Perio. And then I became professor in Perio in the University of Bologna. I had many, many experience abroad, especially in Gothenburg, in the Jan Linde Institute with uh, Jan Benstrom, where I start to move a bit more towards the soft tissue management. 
and uh, I have to tell you that uh, the the I had very very important mentors. My mentors were Professor Calandrello of the University of Bologna, who was the first one who really introduced me to periodontal and then Massimo De Santis, that most probably you know him, who was mm -hmm. also a teacher of mine at the University of Bologna. And we start to work a lot of together. And uh, at that time, we, we wanted to, let's say, uh, find a, a surgical procedure who was able to give more aesthetic outcome to our patients instead of uh, the idea of increasing the keratinized tissue only. And this was, let's say, the starting point uh, for starting to use the Corny Advanced Flap, which was the technique that we developed for uh, multiple gingival recession and for single gingival recession. In the beginning, we tried to work with the Corny Advanced Flap only, and then we moved to go towards the combination of the use of the coronary advanced flap with a connective tissue graph. Cytospecific application of a connective tissue graph was uh, always our concept because we are not used to using the graph for every single gingival recession we are treating, which is something that most probably you have to do when you use other procedure like the tunnel procedure, because the great advantage of the coronary advanced flap, that is a root coverage procedure by itself. Sometimes, if there is no keratinized tissue enough, you have to add connective tissue graph. But what changed, I think, in the last 20 years is not really the technique. I have some nice video which compares how was making the surgical procedure. Uh, let's say, if, if, you, if, if, I, if you want, I can show you just a few uh, minutes of this because it's nice. I, I was showing the procedure in 1998 and today it's, more or less the same. Maybe what changes the type of instrument we use, the type of knife, or uh, the type of suturing, uh, but the surgical procedure was exactly the same. Now, what we have much more is that we are, we know that corneal advanced flap by itself is not always possible to be performed, but it depends on the baseline amount of keratinized tissue. So we are quite uh, standardized. If we don't have keratinized tissue, one minute or uh, one mil millimeter or less, we add the connective tissue graph, but very, very small. If we have more than one millimeters of keratinized tissue, we use also collagen matrix. And then if you want, we can also speak about collagen matrix, which mm -hmm. is not as the corneal connective tissue graph, but it can be used instead of connective tissue graph, provided you have some minor amount of keratinized tissue. While if you have more yeah. than two millimeters of keratinized tissue, we only use the corneal advanced flap. So we are, the awareness of this technique is increased with years, but the technique by itself did not change so much in the last so 20 basically, years. Basically, if, <clears throat> if I understand you correctly, um, and I can, I can very much um, also recognize this in uh, you know, the work that we have done with GBR, is if you really look at the fundamentals and the biological principles, they have not changed uh, too much. Uh, we, that's always the, the, the essence of our success. But of course, like if I understand you correctly, microsurgery has entered a little bit in your field more. Yeah. So you're more, uh, you know, kind of, of course, finer. It's minimal yeah. invasive more. Yeah, the magnification has increased. Magnification. The type of, su of suture, the type of knife, uh, the needle has changed. So many, many things have changed. But, you know, as you were saying, when a surgical procedure is based upon good biological principle, there's no so, so much to change. And this is, I think, why there is other techniques that are like a meteora, you know, that last only two years because mm -hmm. they are, let's say, fashion technique and everybody do it, but after the two years, nobody do it anymore. And this is most right. probably because it's not really based on good uh, biological principle. Why I think that if the technique is in, in uh, uh, biological oriented, it lasts forever, maybe some small changes or some small improvement, but 
not so many. Yeah. The materials. Let me ask you. Change. Let me ask you a specific question clinically because it's, you know, many years ago, many moons ago, I was um, doing my postgraduate program at Loma Linda University, which of course you know, and they had a very a strong focus on coronary reposition flap for periodontal regeneration. And they had this, um, I thought at that time, like, of course, fantastic suturing technique of like coronary repositioning a flap margin and then adding a little bit of composite to the incisal edge of a tooth to keep, of course, the flap in a coronal position. Now, I, I know I've seen you do this, um, but I also have seen you, of course, not to do this. So yeah, yeah. In, is that a standard procedure for you in, uh, in today coronary positioning flaps when you do with grafts or with collagen? Or is that you something the, you decide case by case? The, the coronal suture attached to the composite restoration, you mean? Yes. No, it's, some, it's something that I, I think it's not so biologically based because I think that the only way for the tissue to survive is to give blood supply. So yeah, maybe you can advance it even more than the vascular bed, but then it shrink because there is no blood supply below. So I, I use this technique only in some situation when I want to move the entire complex of the papilla more coronal, but I have to tell you that it's more nice from a let's say surgical point of view, and then there is a lot of shrinkage. So I don't think that this suture make any difference. What is very important is that you place the tissue on the vascular bed. That's why the tissue mm -hmm. remain there. So you have to find bas vascular bed, and that's why I change a bit, especially around the implants, the technique of the coronary advanced flap by trying to extend the area of the papilla that I disapitalize also more palatally in order to advance the flap even more with respect to what you can do with the teeth where there is the contact point between the teeth. But you, you know, it's a suture that sometimes I use, but not, not every single case. It depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think like, you know, it's always interesting for people to see um, some of these like differences. So if you want to show the video, That'd yeah, be fantastic. Well, just take a, a few minutes because like people always like to see like, you know, clinical work being done by an uh, an clinical expert. So yeah, but it's 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 just to show you. Sorry, uh, I will share my screen in a few seconds if you want. Mm -hmm. I just give you, uh, let me share the screen. Can you see me? Me in 1998, can you see it? Yes. <laughs> so this is uh, at that time, me and Massimo De Santis and I was really different from today. But if you look the, you know, the, you know, just, few seconds you know the knife has changed but we now this is the flap design which is performed exactly in the same way it was performed many many years ago but at that time I didn't know I was not so precise in placing the incision in the right position it was more or less the same time where I make the flap design and when I start the papilla elevation Today, I make first of all the design and then I start papilla elevation. And in order to get the right thickness to the apex, I make um, the bevel incision, then I turn the blade. So to keep the right thickness at the level of the tip of the papilla. And you see, despite there is growth in this papilla, I want to keep the right thickness of connected tissue even if uh, there is some invagination of the connective tissue inside the, the epithelium inside the connective tissue. But you look, look in 1998, it's not so different, you know. Obviously the blade is completely different uh, and the precision I was uh, 
making the cat at that time was not so different from today. But today I have the awareness how much it is important to keep the tip of this papilla absolutely intact with the right thickness and keeping the same thickness all along the mesial distal and apical corn dimension of the papilla. Then full thickness elevation with a periostium elevator. Then the split thickness again. Again, this was done. Now I know that the deep incision is very limited and this minimized the patient discomfort while at that time I was using a greater amount of blade inside the tissue, while the deep incision that detach the muscles from the periosteum is very, very limited in apical direction, while the superficial incision where the blade runs superficial, it can be much more extended in apical direction. But if you look at the movie in 1998, this is not so different. So this is the deep incision, very limited. You see that most of the blade is outside of the tissue. And once the periosteum is detached from any muscles, I can move my blade, keeping it in contact to the, like with the probe to the inner aspect of the alveolar mucosa and start to make the superficial incision, keeping the blade parallel to the alveolar mucosa. This is the superficial incision and only with the superficial incision I insert the old blade inside the tissue but this is very superficial and so so superficial there's no any nerve or any big vessels and so the bleeding and the post-operative pain is very very limited. At that time when we started we make a big mess between the big the superficial and the deep incision now it's very very clear what is the deep incision is that one that is done only to detach the muscles from the periosteum and then the superficial is that one we use to advance the flap. Root planing the same, ADTA, it was also used 20 years ago to make some conditioning of the root. Again, there is a difference in the instruments we use to prepare the area of the anatomic papilla to be disepitalized. We use microsurgical scissors to extend the disepitalization towards the most corner tip. And this is the most important difference, I think. You see that uh, the cytospecific application of very, very small connected tissue graft only on those teeth that don't have enough keratinized tissue. Not all teeth. We are treating from one to six, but there is no keratinized tissue at the level of the cannon. And we just take three millimeters height 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeters connected tissue graft, and this is the same from the molar. So cytospecific application is a new concept. At that time, it was only the corn advanced flap or it was only the connected tissue graft. Today, corn advanced flap with some cytospecific application. Then suturing the same and the stability of the flap is more or less the same. At that time, I was also using this horizontal mattress suture that was used to reestablish the vestibulum depth now that I am able to remove much better the muscles from the flap with the deep and superficial incision. I don't use it anymore. The same technique can also be used for, uh, let's say, if you don't have enough, if you don't have, uh, uh, if you have a good amount of keratinized tissue with the use of collagen matrix instead of the use of uh, connected tissue graft, but it's always the same concept, cytospecific application with no sign of graft exposure. That's why we take very, very small graft, not only to minimize the patient discomfort, but also to reduce as much as possible the um, risk of uh, graft exposure. And when, uh, thank you, that, that was very um, useful. Um, <clears throat> And you could indeed see like, just more like the focus on microsurgery and better tissue management just because we understand the anatomy better. Uh, let's, yeah. let's go a little bit into this um, use of biomaterial. So you have been, uh, of course, focusing now on we need to look at site specifically applying a tissue graft. So palatal tissue is one option. 
uh, of course, we have different palettes. Uh, you can maybe explain that. Um, of different palatal uh, locations. And we have, of course, biomaterials, which are usually collagen based. And we have some which are pure collagen, like, uh, you know, Geislick's mucograft. Or we have something which is more also um, has a slight cross linking of collagen, like uh, Geislick's fiber guide. Is there a difference for you? And then, of course, also maybe give us an, um, your personal opinion about yeah. what's used yeah. here in the US about alloderm and allografts. Yeah. I just, just to give you, I, I can share my screen again so I can also show you um, the way we have to take the graph because I think this is very important uh, to understand how the discomfort of our patient can be reduced if we, if we take uh, the right dimension of connective tissue graph. So this is an example of how I take the graph today, and uh, which is very, very similar. I hope you can see this. Yeah, we can see it. So yeah. it, it's very, very similar to the way I elevate the papilla. So we make a horizontal incision very, very close to the teeth, very, very limited superficial vertical incision, and we don't make any incision apical at the beginning. And this minimizes the bleeding during the, during the harvesting procedure. And then at the level of the mesial angle, exactly in the same way I do when I elevate the papilla at the level of the mesial angle, I turn the blade in order to try to keep as soon as possible the blade parallel to the external surface. That's very important because if you keep the blade parallel to the bone, you take enormous amount of thickness and this is very painful for our patient. While if you keep the blade as much as possible parallel to the external surface, it means that you keep the thickness of the graft minimum and the same from the most corner to the most apical aspect. And only once you reach the vertical re the releasing decision, you deep the distal vertical release incision, the minimum you can in order to allow the graft to open completely before being harvested. So this technique now is very standardized. So we make the horizontal incision, we turn the blade at the level of the mesial angle, we keep the blade parallel, then we deep the distal vertical release incision. And once we reach an imaginary line, connecting the most apical extension of the true vertical is incision. This is the time to remove the graft from the palate, but this graft is really thin, but not only thin, it's very, very, it's of the same thickness in the most, in all mesial distal and apical coronal dimension. And this really minimizes the patient post-operative course. Now I remove how the graft. Thick, uh, how, make, uh, Giovanni, how thick is this outer flap? This is 0.7. 0 0.8 maximum. This is for teeth. Obviously, if you need implants, for example, I can show you just to just to show you uh, the same technique, but the connective tissue graph was taken for uh, for implant. It's the only thing that is different is most probably. Can you see here the video? Yes. I don't know. Yes. I will enlarge it a bit. So this is the same technique which is used for a very, very big apical coronal graft because with the graft I have to cover the whole implant exposure, but the technique is the same. At the level of the mesial angle, I turn the blade, I keep the blade parallel to the external surface. And you will see that despite this graft is about, uh, let's say 10 millimeter height and one millimeter thick, there's no bleeding at all with this technique because I never make the apical incision first. I do the mesial one, I do the horizontal one, and then I do the distal. And only once the right apical corner dimension of the graph is taken, this is the time to deep the distal vertical incision, which sometimes bleed a bit more, to keep the blade parallel. And only now I remove the graph by connecting the distal with the mesial vertical release incision. 
the technique mm -hmm. I'm using to take the graph, this is something that everybody knows now. It's a free gingival graph that is disapitalized extraorally. The old fatty and glandular tissue is removed first, and then you place your graph on your surgical table. You use your knife to remove the old epithelium, keeping the blade parallel to the external surface. But I want to show you at the end of the surgery how, what is the situation of the pala? So it's not bleeding at all. I just take a collagen sponge that I apply with a horizontal mattress suture in order to give some stability to the blood clot. And more recently, I also apply some channel acrylates, nothing else, no plate, nothing, because it's very, very superficial. And despite this is a quite big apical corner dimension graph, the patient post-operative, you see at the end of the surgery, it's not bleeding at all. This is the channel acrylate I apply just to give more stability to the blood clot and avoid the patient touch this area and start to bleed in the first hours immediately after the surgery. So this is really what I do every single day, even if I take big graft. So this is the technique of choice for me to take the connective tissue graft. I don't use any more single incision technique in the premolar area because the premolar area is very fatty. There is a lot of glandular tissue, fatty tissue, and this is something that I really don't want to place on my feet or on my implants. So can I, um, can I assume that this is kind of an um, innovation and a modification of the yeah. original periodontal a soft tissue strip graft published by Henry Takei and Thomas Hahn here at UCLA? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think this is really a, a modification in the sequence of the phase of the step to take the graft. Because if you feel, if you follow this sequence, starting from the horizontal incision, then the mesial, then keep parallel, and then the distal, and then remove the graft, and then disapitalize it, you really minimize the patient discomfort because the graft remains very, very thin in the whole apical coronal dimension, and you don't remove too much tissue from the palate. That is the reason why the patient has more pain. So right. I think this is a modification that was performed in 2000, 2010 by our group, even if the technique was published before in 2004, but the let's say the standardization of the technique, how mm -hmm. to harvest and how to disapitalize was a bit more recent. Yeah. You were speaking yeah. about matrix. Uh, just to give you two yeah. words about yeah. the matrix, I have to tell you that the matrix I like today when I cannot or I don't want to take the graft is the... Uh, fiber guide matrix, which is good because it's a great uh, uh, sponge for blood clot stabilization and increase of tissue thickness. Unfortunately, as it is produced, it's too thick to be used on the treatment of gingival resection. Six, six millimeters is very good for soft tissue augmentation in the dental site, for example, but uh, you can reduce this and you can also reshape this matrix as you see from six millimeter, first of all, you cut the right mesial distal and apical coral dimension. It's much better to use always your blade being always also in the way you cut this material, you have to be very, very gentle. Otherwise it can, you can tear the material or you can alter the structure of the material itself. So you take the right dimension, which is obviously bigger than the connective tissue graph, because this is just something that gives stability to the blood clot. And now you can de decide how thick you want. For example, if you have abrasion defect, you take it thicker. If you have root prominence, you, you take it smaller. So you can cut, keeping the two fingers in this way. And then you can also reduce the thickness of the graph in the peripheral area because it's very important that the matrix remain thick in the middle where there is the root. While in the peripheral area, if you reduce the thickness, 
thickness of the material is much either easier to uh, be sutured. So this is like a sort of digitalization of the matrix, which makes the, gra the matrix of the right shape to adapt to the rule. And this is the difference if you use the original material or if you use the modified matrix, you see how nicely this material adapt to the flap and how nicely you can anchor with the suture material the, the, the matrix to the papilla. While when you were using the material with six millimeter thick, it was very difficult to adapt it to the papilla because it was too much thick. Now it's much thinner and it remains thick only in the middle. That is the area where the matrix is working. So, you know, there is also modification, but what is very important is that this matrix is working only if you have some amount of keratinized tissue. If you don't have keratinized tissue at all, you still have to use the connective tissue graph, which is very thick. This is another disadvantage of the thick material. You have also to stabilize apically, while if you have a thinner material, it is the flap by itself that stabilizes the material. So, okay. so let me, <laughs> thank you for, for that. Let me, let me just, um, um, kind of think about this. So clearly you're saying that like when you have a margin of keratinized gingiva, um, even as little as one millimeter, I think I heard you say, is you can in many cases be successful with just a coronal reposition flap. If you have only one millimeter, this is not enough. If you have less okay. than one, you have to add connective tissue graph. Okay. If you have so, from one to two millimeter, you can add the matrix to increase the thickness if you need. For example, okay. if you have root prominence, so you increase also the thickness to be increased. Only if you have more than two millimeters, you can use the corneal advanced, advanced flat by itself. So this is okay. our, let's say, protocol. Okay. You need two okay, millimeters so or more to use the corneal advanced flap by itself. Otherwise, okay. it's much better to use or the collagen matrix or the connective tissue graph. Perfect. Okay, so that's that's a good um, kind of recommendation for our viewers. So basically, over two millimeters, we can probably be successful based on your research. Between one and two, we can use a biomaterial, so a package, so to speak and anything less than one, we definitely want to go to the palate to increase the keratinization. But with Perfect. this technique, the amount of palate you can take is really very, very reduced. For teeth, I never use... No de este lado, eh? For teeth, I never use more than four millimeters high connected visigraph. Even if the root is exposed 10 millimeters, I just take a strip of three, four millimeters in the most coronal area to stabilize the flap. Okay. So let's, let's make a question about uh, both of our expertise, but we're looking at it at, from two different aspects. You, when we have an implant exposure, right? we have an implant exposure, which has like, you know, titanium exposed, threats are exposed, and now, of course, I always get very nervous and I want <laughs> that uh, titanium implant exposure to have bone. If I don't have bone on my implant exposure, I cannot, I cannot sleep at night. So um, you can sleep really good if you have no bone on the buccal implant exposure because you put a nice connective tissue graft, you do a coronary positioning and you're happy. So yeah. explain me first, I, why are you happy on an implant no. exposure biologically, no. <laughs> connective tissue only? Yeah, I'm not, I have to tell you that it's not true that I'm really happy. I prefer to have bone also, but okay. I want to really clarify this concept. I'm so happy to do it with you that uh, you are a great master, a great uh, you know, master all of us in implant therapy, because sometimes I think there is some, uh, let's say, do you see here, do you see implant, do you two different mm -hmm. type of bone deletions? Yes. yes. I, think, I think that there is a big mess 
also into the literature because everybody speaks about buccal bone deletions. And so buccal bone deletions with implant exposure means that there is no buccal bone at the buccal surface of the implant. And this can be due because there is really loss of buccal bone, but the implant is placed in the right position, which is more palatally, or mm -hmm. It can be that there is no buccal bone because somebody made a mistake and placed the implant outside of the bone. So this implant is placed too much buccal, you know, and there is no how to regenerate bone to the implant if the implant is placed outside of the level of the bone of also of the adhesion teeth, which is also bone, bundle bone, mainly because the root has only bundle bone. If the root, if the implant is placed more buccally than the bundle bone of the two adhesion teeth, you cannot regenerate bone in this situation. So it depends. So if you have buccal bone loss, but the implant is placed in the right position, obviously I prefer to have bone and so I make bone augmentation. But if the implant is placed outside completely outside of the level of the bone, you cannot pretend to have new bone at the buccal aspect of this implant. If you want to have bone, you have to take the implant out, place it in the right position, more palatally, and then regenerate the bone and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I mean, if I have implant exposure due to bad implant installation, there is no alternative to soft disagmentation because the situation in which the implant is placed outside of the level of the bone can only be managed with soft tissue augmentation procedure like the tooth. Also, when the tooth is outside of the bone, you cannot make bone augmentation. This is something that we know from the beginning. The root is placed too much buccal. It's placed outside of the buccal bone and nobody in the world pretend to have new bone on this root and everybody who wants to cover this root, even if it's 10 millimeter exposed, only use soft tissue. And this is the same for implant. If the implant is placed outside of the bone, the only thing you can do if you want to keep the implant is to make soft tissue management at the buccal aspect, no alternative, which means connective tissue graft. While if you want to have bone, you have to place the implant inside the level of the bone. And then if there is no bone, you can regenerate the bone. I also like to have your opinion about this. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with this. So like definitely the discussion about the left case that you had like with an implant placed within the bony housing is of course perfect for a GBR procedure and it's the correct treatment. Um, the patient that you presented on the right side is interesting for me uh, because I get so many patients with of course implants placed to buckle and then always like, you know, I, I cannot do a GBR, as you said, because the implant is placed too far buccal. Um, so then I have to tell the patient, okay, maybe like we can uh, remove the implant. That's probably the best thing. But as a plan B, uh, which we don't know, and that's probably, uh, I'm going to ask you the question now again, is if yeah, I that's do a very nice tissue, to discuss with you, you know, you know, I yeah. think that one of the most important thing is uh, yeah obviously how much buccally the implant is placed is very important how much bone is lacking in the buccal aspect is important but most probably is also important if the bone surface is also contaminated or not because there is many many implants that are outside of the bone where the soft tissue is still covering it and this means that this implant surface was never contaminated and so if it was not contaminated this is a very good option to keep the implant while if the implant threads are exposed to the oral cavity or you can probe between the tissue and the implant you know that it was contaminated this is another problem you have to face that is the decontamination. So most probably the best solution is to, to remove the implant. It was nice because I was also discussing this topic a lot with your friend Massimo Simeon. And he was saying that every single time I see an implant that is placed too much buccally, I remove it. And I say, that's, that's I, I absolutely understand it. But it's also true that especially for our patient, remove the implant and starting everything from the beginning is not always the best solution. So if yeah. you can give a good aesthetic outcome, and I have to tell you that I have very, very long term outcome of coverage of the implant, even more than 10 years outcome, where the coverage is still stable after 10 years. And 
the opposite. There is some increase in the coverage and increase in the soft tissue thickness with time. But obviously, it's a choice. It depends how much the implant is placed bad. Obviously, there should be any perimplantitis at all. So there is no, no contamination of the implant surface. Uh, and so it's, you know, a choice. It's also very important how sure you are that you can unscrew the implant. This is very important thing. How, how, you know, if I know that the implant can be unscrewed with some specific tool, yes, I think that implant removal is a very good option because you don't have any risk for the BHN teeth, especially if the implant is very, very close to one tooth. While if you know that you have to remove the, the implant surgically, for example, by making osteotomy or something like this, you know, I think a bit more about keeping the implant because, you know, it can be really very, very invasive. And also the aesthetic mm -hmm. outcome after, after boning, bone augmentation, soft augmentation is not so predictable like uh, uh, it is if you can keep the implant sometimes. So it's always a choice in my opinion. Yeah, I have no I, doubt. I, yeah, I, I have like, you know, uh, an implant removal tool, which is like super easy, and you probably know this, but it's the reverse torque that I use from uh, Noble Biocare. And that really, like, especially in the maxilla, can, uh, can reverse torque an implant with really little trauma. But I'm interested in the long term, uh, you know, like reviews that you have done and documentations, because we know there's studies from like the original Brandemar group that if implants are healthy, and if implants have on the buccal surface titanium exposed, they can stay healthy for like, again, 10 plus years without bone. So it's an interesting uh, aspect, but I just want to make sure that the viewer also understands that like, you know, when you are selecting a patient, you're using a lot of experience over, you know, 20, 30 years uh, of knowing when to remove the implant and when maybe to do soft tissue, because it is like a compromised condition that you have, and you have to feel comfortable to know that there's no infection, as you say, that the implant is not too far out of the bone, so like that the soft tissue can help. But it's impressive to see that some of these implants with soft tissue only can actually succeed for 10 plus years, and that's to the benefit of the patient. I absolutely agree. The problem is the thickness of the tissue, because if the thickness of the tissue is not enough let's let it means it should be more than two millimeters thick otherwise the risk of recession continue and so the risk of uh, contamination of the implant surface increase and so i think that the key is not only to cover by itself but to cover by increasing the thickness of the tissue that's why you need for sure to add a connective tissue graph in this case there is no alternative while in the teeth, we can also apply matrix when you have to cover metallic surface, exposed metallic surface, you need to increase the thickness so much to reach at least two millimeters of this thickness. And so there's no how to do it with the matrix. Since the flat most of the time is very, very thin, you always need to add, let's say 1.5 sometimes 1.8 millimeters of connective tissue graph in order to compensate for a very, very thin soft tissue that is covering the implant. So the thickness becomes critical to cover the metallic surface and also to mask the transparency. So for the aesthetic outcome, not only for the maintenance long-term, but also for the aesthetic outcome, because most of the time, this, is, is indica this indication is for aesthetic when you are in the aesthetic areas and the patient see that there is some metallic exposure or some transparency. That's why the patient is not happy about the outcome. But if there's no contamination, it's only a question of transparency or metallic exposure at the buccal aspect. I think that soft disagmentation procedure are really very, very effective. Mm -hmm. um, do you use still like any of those other materials like uh, mucograft or alloderm in your office? Or you for 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 implant, I cannot recommend this because the problem is in that you teeth? have to. Oh yes, in the natural teeth, I as I told you, I prefer to use the fibroguide, the muco, the muco, the mucoderm, the mucograft. Sorry, it's very very thin. It's not thick mm -hmm. enough. 
and so I just use it as a seal sometimes of the socket just to isolate the bone material, for example, for the oral cavity, but I don't use anymore to increase the soft tissue thickness. I think the FibroGuide is much better for this indication because it's like a sponge incorporate much more thickness of blood clot. How, how about the allograft material, like an alloderm or something like that? You know, the, the experience we have in Europe is very limited because we are not allowed to use it, even if I use it a lot in my experience in the United States. And I have to tell you that really my, my opinion is that there is no so many indication for this material because it's very difficult to handle, very difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. And since this is so stiff, this is so thick, this is so difficult to cover, I think that for the, also for the patient, it's much better to take a very, very thin, minimally invasive connective tissue graft instead of trying to cover something that is so difficult and there is a lot of risk to create problems to your flap because this material to be covered is not a matrix, that's something that you can stabilize, that you can compress a bit, but the material that uh, the, the alloderm is something that really have some risk for necrosis of the flap. And also, you know, from a surgical point of view, it's much more difficult to be used than the connective tissue graft or the coronary advanced flap by itself. So I don't yeah, see I, I too many indication. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in California and Los Angeles. So of course I have the material available, but I never use it and, um, <laughs> or any kind of like, you know, indication for root coverage on implants or bone. If I go to collagen, I will do. You know, uh, the, the problem is that like, more, yeah, you, yeah, because you have a lot of troubles surgically and then the thickness that remains with time is really very, very reduced. And so with the connective tissue graph, it's exactly the opposite. You have very, very thin graph that increase in thickness with time. So this is something that I don't like to use it at all. If I don't want to take a connective tissue graph, I prefer to use a collagen matrix. That is something that works biologically much better. Right. Uh, give us maybe like a short um, experience on... Uh, which many of us have to deal with, like, you know, teeth, when there is like, you know, these abrasions or even some decay, and, you know, we have maybe a composite filling on there. How do you treat these patients um, uh, from a root coverage procedure? Is that, is that yeah, different well, for you or you just clean them out? No, no, I, I think it's, it's really very important to understand uh, that, for example, I just okay, I can share with you just a, a, a case like this. Uh, where is my share scheme? So what is very important is uh, to understand that uh, when you have abrasion, non carous cervical lesion defect, uh, you have to. Can you see the case now? Yeah. That's that's an interesting case. Yeah, you see that there is so many tooth decay in the so many, so many non carous cervical lesion. What is very important is that you don't have to restore with the composite restoration the area belonging to the root. So you have to restore with the composite restoration only the area belonging to the crown. So you have to identify the new cement dynamic junction. And when you have such a complex case, it's not easy, but you have to use the aesthetic parameters, the aesthetic rules that tells you, you know, this is where I would like to have the central, this is where I would like to have the lateral, this is where I would like to have the cannon. The cannon should be a more, bit more apical than the central, the lateral should be a more coronal than the central. So the aesthetic parameters can be used. And then once they, only the coronal area only the coronal area has been restored with the composite restoration. You have to leave the whole root to be covered by the soft tissue. So it's very important that most of the non carous cervical lesion belongs to the enamel. And this is the area that has to be restored before the surgery. But don't extend the composite restoration to the area that is coverable with the soft tissue and block the area to be covered. So the composite restoration to the canine is placed a bit more apical than the composite restoration to the lateral 
and the, the composite restoration of the center is in the middle because I like to have the center that is a bit more apical than the lateral and the canon is a bit more apical, same level of the center. Two canons, same level, two lateral, the same level, two central. So it's the aesthetic parameters that guide us where to make the new cement enamel junction. And then we make the surgery with the cytospecific application of the connective tissue graph. The flap is advanced coronally on the composite restoration. And this is the first outcome. And this is the outcome at the end where you can see that there is the enamel, there is the soft tissue. And uh, if you look at the before and after, you can understand that some of the recession were treated really with a composite restoration, but most of the recession were treated with uh, uh, soft tissue. The problem is the long term of this restoration that sometimes patients ask us how long this is a seven years outcome, for example, how long do this restoration last? I think that they last quite long, but as you can see, you can, some, you can see some minor change of the color. And so most of the time you cannot say this is forever, but nothing is forever. But it's very important because this composite restoration can be used to make the soft tissue heal. And once the soft tissue is completely healed, and increase in the thickness, you can also change them. And if you want, you can make veneering, which is more probably more aesthetic and more long lasting. So this is the case which was solved with the composite restoration only. This is the case before and after two years of composite restoration, then the composite restoration were removed and were substituted by veneers. So the composite restoration is something that we use to treat the non carous cervical lesion and to use the and to to be used instead of the enamel for giving stability to your flap once the soft tissue is increasing thickness is complete, completely mature if you don't so much the aesthetic appearance of the composite restoration like this you can remove the restoration but the soft tissue in the right position and you can make veneering so i think it's also something that we can use as a temporary solution before the final solution that is more aesthetic but at the same but in terms of surgery in terms of soft tissue maturation they have a very very critical role to give stability to your flap that is advanced coronary so it's very Good. important to do the composite restoration before the surgery but the composite restoration should finish at the level of the cement enamel junction then you treat the soft tissue you treat the root with the soft tissue and then if you want you can move or you can change with time the composite restoration into veneering. Okay, uh, that's very very clear. I like that, um, Giovanni. Like it's it's of course as I told you at the beginning of our interview, uh, the interview is only one hour, and when you have a great guest like uh, Giovanni Zucchelli, one hour goes by so fast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think. Uh, we maybe have to plan for another one in the near future. And I will um, be happy to do it. I will be really <laughs> happy. And of course, uh, whatever I can do for you, I will do the same. Um, and uh, really I really hope to come back to Los Angeles in person because it was a great experience and I hope to repeat it when this drama will finish. Yes. And I just want to tell the audience, because I, I just heard it myself, um, uh, Giovanni um, has just been uh, awarded the uh, honorary membership of the American Academy of Periodontology. And um, of course, I've been a member of the American Academy for many years being a periodontist. It's really an incredible honor. You, I think also you're the first Italian with so many uh, fantastic Italian periodontists in, uh, in Italy, many of them trained in the US. So from me personally, like, you know, a great congratulations uh, from, of course, the audience. I'm sure they're all like very happy for you. And uh, you can be proud and privileged that, you know, you got this honor uh, from the American Academy. Because, you yeah, know, it's really true. Do that, it's really true. They don't do that was, easy to Europeans and Italians. No, no, it was really unexpected, but it was such a great satisfaction that it's unbelievable, you know, for an Italian guy to become an honorary member of the American Academy of Perio is really like a dream. 
really. Yeah. I was so happy about this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so with that, I want to um, finish. First of all, I want to um, present this to you because Giovanni has an, uh, a very, very uh, strong and important uh, textbook with Quintessence. And uh, I discussed it with Quintessons personally. So they're giving to anybody who is interested in uh, a discount of 35%. Um, uh, you see here the QR code. So that's something you could do. And of course, that's uh, available like in different languages that you can have here. Um, also, at the same time, um, I want to thank uh, Geislick because they're, of course, interested because of the a uh, fiber guide to be a uh, part of this here. And uh, I think we had a very clear discussion uh, amongst, uh, between Giovanni and myself, uh, where this material is indicated and where it's not indicated. So that's, that's really important. Uh, from guide's perspective, uh, remember we have a uh, whole series of online masterclasses available to our subscribers. So uh, don't miss out on that at this moment. Actually, we have a very active program called the Implant Prostodontic. Uh, every masterclass has live sessions like this. So that's really good. And for those of you who are interested really in um, the topic of today, soft tissue management, um, you can see here, we have an online masterclass, which um, I have moderated, uh, which has really like a good registration. We had like something like 350 people. And um, of course, we go a little bit into implants, we go a little bit into soft tissue, but it really follows the topics that, um, that Giovanni presented today. Um, I invite you, if you have not been a member of GUIDE, of course, become a member, because then pretty much everything that you see here is available to you. And uh, all these things that we're doing here during this difficult time, <clears throat> we started with like, you know, because of COVID, we're at home. We started sharing all this information, but now I think the future is also going to be more online. So we have to continue learning like this. So these are the final uh, slides of mine. So follow guide at guide dental, uh, follow guide at Instagram. These are the QR codes. And um, then hopefully we'll stay together and be together really, really fast again. And Giovanni, with thank your you friend, so future friend, Mihailovic. Um, <laughs> thank you for me. Thank you so much. Molto, molto, molto gentile. Molto grazie. Una buona serata e, e un buona notte. Grazie a tutti. Bye-bye. Okay. Ciao. Ciao, Giovanni. Ciao, ciao. ciao.